This is the last physio lecture for the semester. Um, we're finishing a little bit early because there is a lot that you need to look over for the final exam. Um, remember that it's semi-cumulative, meaning there will be some of those most missed questions making another appearance on the exam. I'm hoping to get the study guide posted in the next week or so, which means that over fall break, you can be working on your papers and also studying for the final exam in between everything else that you're doing. I know you guys are super busy, but hopefully allowing a few weeks um, before the final exam will give you time to adequately prepare. Um, remember that this week is uh, off from new material uh, other than wrapping up this learning unit in order to work on your papers. Next week is fall break. The following week is your uh, lab exam, your lab final, and then the week after that is the lecture final. So we're really coming up on the end here. Um, the, on December 13th, we have the lecture final as well as term papers being due. And remember, I am not going to accept any late papers because I have to have grades submitted by December 16th. So you need to get them turned in as soon as possible. You can also email me a draft so that I can look over it and give you feedback. Okay, so getting into this material, we already talk about, talked about the physiology of reproductive systems. Now we're going to think about the physiology of inheritance. And in lab on Friday, you're going to be working through a lot of genetics problems in addition to a urinalysis lab. So the first part of this lecture on inheritance, or patterns of inheritance, so 28.7, um, that is going to be really important for lab on Friday. And I'm going to send you a reminder to please watch that portion of the video. Um, the rest of it on the physiology of fertilization, implantation, pregnancy, and childbirth is also important for the lecture final, but you have a little bit more time to work through that. So please make sure you check those time points and that you focus primarily on patterns of inheritance first. Okay, so these are the uh, different learning objectives. I have them listed um, in the focus points above this lecture, so hopefully you look over them. I'm going to not go through them here, but instead go through them with their matching sections. So this is talking about chapter 28, development and inheritance. And again, we're going to talk first about inheritance and genetics and then get into the physiology of development. Okay, so thinking about patterns of inheritance, you need to be able to distinguish between genotype and phenotype, perform basic Punnett square crosses, and analyze pedigrees for autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-link dominant, X-link recessive, patterns of inheritance. So those are kind of different qualities about alleles, and we'll think about um, how different conditions are passed on and make predictions for genotype and phenotype ratios that way. You also need to be able to answer basic questions about codominance and incomplete dominance. Then we'll get into fertilization and talk about acrosomal reactions and the mechanism of in vitro fertilization. We'll get into embryonic development and think about the signaling and physiological changes of implantation, changes in amniotic fluid and the relationship of that to kidneys and circulation, as well as basic functions of the placenta. We'll think about fetal development, so review the sexual differentiation that we talked about at the end of the last lecture, and think about fetal cardiovascular and digestive physiology, as well as some complications. So we'll look at a particular case study and relate that to APGAR score on the next um, section. Um, we'll think about thermoregulatory GI and urinary adjustments that infants can make after they're born. We'll think about the process of pregnancy, labor, and birth and how that affects the caring parent. So re relating back to endocrinology as well as um, our reproductive system, um, reproductive endocrinology. We'll think about how estrogen, progesterone, and HCG or human chorionic gonadotropin are involved in maintaining pregnancy. Last time we talked about them in the context of the ovarian and uterine cycles and kind of if a case where we don't have pregnancy. Here we'll continue on with an example of pregnancy. We'll also think about basic physiological changes to organ systems, so the digestive, urinary, circulatory, and respiratory systems, as well as the physiology of childbirth, and finally end with the letdown reflex, an example of a positive feedback loop, and bring it back to the general composition of breast milk, which we talked about way back in week three. Okay, so thinking about patterns of inheritance, um, I just wanted to review some basic helpful terms uh, that you're going to be working with. Um, this is something you should have learned in Bio 5, but I just want to remind you. 
Um, when we have DNA, it's often stored in chromosomes, which is a package of DNA. Um, it's kind of like a street. So I'm just going to be working with this analogy and expand, expanding it outward. A chromosome is like a big street and distributed along a street, you have houses. So genes are kind of like houses. They're the coding section of DNA. They code for proteins or parts of proteins. They have protein products, protein synthesis products. Um, a chromosome does not consist entirely of genes. There is what we sometimes refer to as junk DNA between them. Um, the genes have parts of them that are actively transcribed and other parts that are spliced out. Um, but there's, a, uh, if you have a street, it has you know yards, it has fences, it has the road itself. It's not all houses. So a chromosome has genes, but it's not all genes. And when we're trying to locate a gene, we use something called the locus. So that is just the position of the gene on the chromosome. Um, and it's kind of like the house's address. It's denoting a particular location um, on the chromosome. And so you can think about that also locus location. It has that LOC telling you it's something about the position. So when we look at different homologous chromosomes, we say that at a particular locus, they have the same gene. Um, and so when we're looking at those genes, they might be different forms of the gene. They might be different alleles, which are just alternate forms of a gene. So for example, um, in the neighborhood I grew up in, my friend also grew up in that same neighborhood and we had the exact same house. It was just a different color. So it's the same general protein product, just different forms of it. Um, another example is my dad is Indian, my mom is white, so my dad has brown eyes, my mom has blue eyes. Uh, my dad and mom both have eyes, they both have genes that code for their eye structure and for those different pigments, um, but they're just different forms of them. So they're just different forms of the same genes, they're different alleles. So again, to expand on that, Gene, or alleles are alternate forms of genes. So example, brown eye versus blue eye. It, eye color is a little bit more complicated than that, but that's often how we simplify it. Um, or if we're looking at this diagram over here, these chromosomes are a homologous pair. So they're the same size, same shape, same centromere position, um, and similar banding patterns. And at a particular locus, they have the same gene, just different alleles. So this one has an allele for purple flowers. This one has an allele for white flowers. So both copies of those homologous chromosomes have all the same genes, but may have different alleles of those genes. So when we're thinking about which one we actually see, whether it's brown versus blue or purple versus white, we're thinking about whether the allele is considered dominant or recessive. And that's kind of in cases of uh, simple dominance. A lot of the time there's other multi-gene interactions, a lot of stuff kind of happening here, um, but we're just gonna focus first on dominant versus recessive. And I like to think about this like volume. So for example, if I have two little speakers representing two sets of DNA, um, and they're both playing classical music, I'll be able to hear it. But if I turn one of those speakers to metal and you know it's loud, that's all I'm gonna be able to hear. I'm not gonna be able to hear the classical music anymore. So we say that metal is dominant over classical music, certain alleles are dominant over other alleles. If I have both speakers blasting metal, then of course that's what I'm gonna hear, but when there's two different alleles, two different music types coming out of those speakers, the dominant one is the one that we actually end up seeing that gets expressed. Um, so we'll talk later about co-dominance and incomplete dominance, but just thinking about simple dominance, one allele is dominant over the other. I also want to clarify that sometimes people think about dominance uh, the same as frequency. So in this case, dominance just means that that is what's actually getting expressed and is visible. Um, frequency is completely different. So for example, if you went to uh, Norway, you would see a lot of people with 
white skin and blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, and so you might think, oh, maybe that's dominant. It's not, it's just a more frequent set of alleles. If someone from Norway were to reproduce with someone from India, um, you would see a lot of the Indian type of alleles being expressed because they are dominant over the other alleles. Um, so again, nothing to do with frequency, just what ends up getting seen. So we often uh, kind of demarcate different alleles and their qualities about them according to capital or lowercase letters. So a capital letter, any type of letter, um, relates to the dominant allele. A lowercase letter relates to the recessive allele, uh, but sometimes people use uh, asterisks or slashes or um, they might use A and B and O like we do with blood typing. Uh, so it just kind of depends. But oftentimes, especially if it's not explicitly stated differently, you can use an uppercase letter for dominant and a lowercase letter for recessive. That's the convention. So when we're looking at um, those genes coming together and like what's actually in your cells, we're thinking about your genotype. It's your type of genes. What's in your DNA? What alleles do you have for a certain gene? When we're looking at the actual physical protein products, that's the phenotype. That's the physical type, it's how it looks. Um, sometimes we can actually see that. We can look at someone's dark hair or blue eyes. Um, we can kind of observe those different characteristics, but there are sometimes there's proteins that we can't necessarily see. Um, so for example, there's a chemical called PTC, which is found in uh, broccoli and other cruciferous vegetables that's very bitter tasting. You, when you put that uh, chemical on a piece of paper and distribute it in a classroom, uh, about three fourths of the people can taste that bitter taste, including me, which is a pain because I do this with my students all the time, um, but then about a fourth of the students can't taste it. And the reason for that is because being able to taste that particular chemical, having the receptors for it on our tongue, having that gustation, uh, is controlled by simple dominance. It's a genetic one gene situation. Um, so either you are homozygous dominant, which we'll talk about in just a moment, um, or heterozygous, and you produce those receptors, or you're homozygous receptive or recessive, and you don't. So it's all about you know the protein products, those receptors, which is something we can't see just by looking at someone, but it's still part of the phenotype. Um, another example of this are uh, blood blood types. So for example, if you're type A, you have those A antigens uh, coded for and expressed on the surface of your red blood cells. That's something that I can't look at you and see, but it is a physical characteristic. So phenotype is a little bit more broad than just colors and relative size. Okay, so I mentioned some of these interactions, but remember we are diploid organisms. We have two sets of chromosomes in all of our cells except for our gametes. Um, and so when we're looking at our alleles, we're looking at a combination, one allele from mom, one allele from dad, or from one parent and the other parent. Um, so when we see that homozygous dominant, two dominant alleles, or heterozygous, one dominant, one recessive. You don't have to say heterozygous dominant or anything. Hetero means different. It's just two different ones. That's all you say. We see the dominant phenotype. When you're homozygous recessive, two recessive alleles, you see the recessive allele or you see the recessive trait. Uh, but you only see the recessive trait in these cases when you are homozygous recessive. So this kind of indicates that we can tell something about the genotype based on the phenotype, but it gets a little bit tricky because just based on phenotype, you can't distinguish between homozygous dominant and heterozygous. So you need to have multiple crosses in order to track that. Um, so just a quick note, DNA, remember, can code for more DNA through DNA replication or it can code for proteins kind of indirectly through protein synthesis. Um, DNA replication happens at a very strict timeline during the synthesis phase of interphase. Protein synthesis is happening 
very, very frequently. So our cells are always needing different proteins. It's more of a constant process. Um, and protein synthesis always relates to central dogma, which I'll expand on in the next slide. So central dogma, again, is very different from DNA replication in uh, central dogma. DNA is transcribed. It acts as a code for messenger RNA, um, and we use that uh, enzyme RNA polymerase to assemble that RNA molecule. Then mRNA acts as a code for proteins, specifically amino acids. That process is translation, and it's done using ribosomes and tRNA. So DNA here is the genotype, protein products are the phenotype. And so we see that there's an inherent relationship between uh, the DNA and the protein products. So one way that I like to think about this is that when we go through DNA replication, it's like photocopying the whole cookbook of what makes you who you are. Transcription is specifically copying down or writing down a recipe, a single recipe, from that cookbook, and translation is then cooking using that recipe. So when we're thinking about this process overall, we might say transcription and translation, we might say central dogma, we might say gene expression or protein synthesis. All of these are technically slightly different, but they all essentially point to the same underlying relationship between genotype and phenotype. So remember, when we um, are thinking about different processes, um, meiosis is this process of going, producing two haploid gametes. They come together through fertilization. We get a diploid zygote that now has chromosomes, that now has two sets of DNA um, from those two original gametes. So we have the interaction between those sets of DNA, and we're gonna start figuring out how those diploid zygotes look. So genetics really helps us predict the results of fertilization. It helps us say if a sperm and an egg come together, what are the diploid zygotes going to look like? The trouble is that when uh, eggs and sperm are formed through meiosis, through oogenesis and spermatogenesis, we don't know which particular alleles from the parent are going into those gametes. So it's a numbers game. We have to solve different problems. We have to use these tools in order to predict um, using math, using quantitative analysis, how haploid gametes come together to make diploid offspring. So when we're saying Mendelian, that's referring to this guy named Gregor Mendel. He was a monk in the 1800s. Um, and back then, going into the monastery was a great way to get access to education if you weren't able to pay for it through a private location. Um, so Gregor Mendel's family was not particularly wealthy. In fact, his sister gave up her dowry in order to support his education, um, but he ended up becoming a monk. And when you're at a monastery back in the day, you kind of either brewed beer or you wrote in illuminated manuscripts or you worked in a garden. And Gregor Mendel worked with pea plants. So he studied very observable traits in pea plants and he kind of looked out when he picked certain traits that had a kind of simple dominance patterns. So he used quantitative data to show how these particular traits were passed through generations and traits that follow these simple genetic patterns are called Mendelian. So we might say that a gene or a trait or an interaction is Mendelian or non-Mendelian. And a lot of Mendel's work can kind of be simplified according to two main laws that he stated. Um, one of those is the law of segregation, which is basically meiosis forms haploid gametes. The other is the law of independent assortment, which is that chromosomes assort or go into gametes independently of one another. That means that a set of chromosomes from mom doesn't stick together and end up all in the same gamete. They get mixed up with chromosomes from dad when eggs and sperm are formed. And when we say mom and dad, we mean the parents of the individual who is undergoing spermatogenesis or oogenesis and making eggs and sperm. So one very common biological tool that we use are Punnett squares. And I think a lot of us have experience uh, in middle school and high school of just putting letters together, um, knowing that you know some of them are homozygous dominant, some of them are homozygous recessive, some of them are heterozygous, but not really conceptualizing that this is predicting what happens when we form eggs and then 
form sperm and bring those eggs and sperm together. Um, so often I like to visualize this by actually putting those letters into the eggs and into the sperm, forming those haploid gametes, and then bringing them together within the punnett square to produce diploid zygotes. So these punnett squares not only predict the genotypes, but if you understand the relationship between those two alleles, they predict the phenotypes of a large group of offspring from different sets of parents. So it's a way to predict the possible progeny produced by fertilization between an egg and sperm. Another biological tool that you'll be looking at briefly in lab are pedigrees. And so these are basically family trees with kind of uh, conventions of how to draw them. Generally male individuals, uh, so chromosomal males are drawn with squares, chromosomal females are drawn with circles. And when you're tracking a particular condition, if it's shaded in, that means that the individual is affected by that condition. And some pedigrees have um, these lines going through them to indicate which family members might be deceased. So this family tree is really a genetic representation of a family tree that diagrams the inheritance of a trait or disease through several generations. And it's important because it identifies relationships between individuals as well as the chromosomal sex of individuals. So it kind of helps us uh, observe and visualize patterns of inheritance. One thing that you can gain from pedigrees and punnett squares is the phenotype ratio. So it's the likelihood of the offspring expressing the dominant and recessive traits. So we take the number of offspring expressing the dominant trait and uh, put that as a ratio against the number of offspring expressing the recessive trait. Um, so you might also calculate the probability of something happening. In that case, we take whatever it is we're looking for and divide it by the total number of offspring. So just think very carefully about whether you're doing a ratio or a fraction and probability. We can also calculate sometimes the genotype ratio or genotypic ratio, which we can sometimes infer or use uh, pure breeding to determine. So this is the likelihood of inheriting certain combinations of alleles, so not the trait, but the alleles. And so if, for example, we're assuming simple autosomal dominance, meaning that this gene, these alleles are on uh, chromosomes one through 22, not a sex chromosome, um, capital A is the dominant allele, lowercase a is the recessive allele. When we calculate our genotype ratio, we're now gonna have maybe three different numbers because we also have to consider homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and homozygous recessive. So for example, if um, capital A is the dominant allele, lowercase a is the recessive allele, our genotype ratio would be the number of big A, big A, to the number of big A, little a, to the number of little a, little a. So for example, if we're looking at a punnett square and going from a pure breeding line or two separate pure breeding lines, um, when we say pure breeding, we mean that we know for sure that this individual is big A, big A, because all of their relatives for many generations were big A, big A. For this one, we know that it's little a, little a, because all of its ancestors for generations were little a, little a. So they're pure breeding or true breeding. We know for sure their genotype. So when we cross them, we know for sure what the allele combinations, what the genotypes of the offspring are going to be. And in this case, they result in all of the dominant phenotype and all of the dominant, or that, um, sorry, not dominant, heterozygous uh, genotype. So there's uh, no homozygous dominant, there's uh, no homozygous recessive, it's all heterozygous. Um, when you cross two individuals from that first generation um, and we produce the, uh, sorry, from that first generation cross, so we take two individuals from the second generation and cross those together, again, we know that they're both heterozygotes. And so we can then also know something about um, the genotypes of the offspring. So a cross between two heterozygotes results in a three to one phenotype ratio. So we have um, 
we have one individual right here who's homozygous dominant. We have two individuals who are heterozygotes. So that's one, two, three individuals with that dominant trait. And then we have one individual right here with the recessive trait, with the recessive phenotype. So it's a three to one phenotype ratio and a one to two to one genotype ratio. And actually, I really should have written this up here, zero to four to zero genotype ratio, because it should be only heterozygotes. Um, so when we have a cross between two hybrids, when we have a cross between two heterozygotes, it's called a monohybrid cross. So this three to one phenotype ratio and one to two to one genotype ratio is characteristic of a monohybrid cross. Okay, so we're gonna look through specific patterns of inheritance. And when we're talking about autosomal dominant, we're generally referring to a particular condition. So when we say something like, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, it means that uh, it's telling you something about the location on the chromosomes as well as the characteristics of that phenotype. So whether you have to have at least one dominant allele or whether it's only expressed when you have um, only recessive alleles. So for autosomal dominant, this means that it's located on an autosome, which is chromosomes one through 22, not a sex chromosome like X or Y. It also means that you just need one dominant allele in order to express this particular phenotype. Um, so it's either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Um, so one example of this is neurofibromatosis type one, uh, which is a condition that induces tumor formation within the nervous system and leads to skin and skeletal deformities. So if we have one parent who is heterozygous and one parent who is uh, homozygous recessive, um, that means that one parent for sure has this condition, the other parent for sure does not, um, but the parent who does have this condition also has one allele that is recessive, that does not result in this condition. Um, so when we look at the offspring, we have two heterozygotes and two homozygous recessive. So 50% have that dominant um, phenotype and 50% have the recessive phenotype. They don't show the disease. Um, so this is kind of like a classical Punnett square. This is what a lot of people are used to doing. So when we're looking at autosomal recessive, that means that you can only have recessive alleles in order to actually see this condition. Um, it's autosomal, meaning that it's located on an autosome, um, and it's also recessive, meaning that the uh, phenotype is only expressed when the genotype is homozygous recessive. So a very common example of this that's used in genetics classes or intro bio classes is cystic fibrosis. Um, that's that condition that causes really thick mucus to build up in the lungs and the digestive tract, and it leads to a lot of serious infections and problems. So one tricky thing is that when we're thinking about recessive conditions, we really wanna focus on carriers. So these are individuals who are heterozygous. We use carrier interchangeably with heterozygotes. Um, and so these are individuals that don't appear to have the condition, but they are carrying an allele that codes for it, meaning that if they pair with someone else who is carrying an allele, their offspring can have this condition. Um, so for this example, we have a carrier father and a carrier mother. Um, when they, they are both heterozygotes, when they reproduce, there's a 75% chance that their offspring will not have cystic fibrosis, but there's a 25% chance that they will. Um, so in this situation, it's an unaffected son, a carrier daughter, a carrier son, and an effective do affected daughter. Um, so I also want to point out that this is autosomal, so there's not necessarily a relationship between uh, their chromosomal sex and the condition. It's equally likely that it might be an unaffected daughter and a, a affected son. So other examples of autosomal recessive include sickle cell anemia, uh, which uh, in which the heterozygote confers an advantage against malaria. Um, and so that's why that recessive allele sticks around 
Tay-Sachs disease, which is also kind of an example of incomplete dominance, um, and phenylketonuria. Uh, and these conditions tend to be much more common in isolated populations where people are more likely to uh, reproduce with people that are genetically similar to them. Um, if you don't have influx of new alleles, then uh, it's more likely that some of these recessive alleles will come together. So before we get into sex-linked traits, I just want to remind you that when we say sex cells, we mean sperm and eggs, that each of these is made through a process called meiosis. They are haploid. They have half the usual amount of DNA, which is randomly put into their, um, into their contents. So you just end up with one full set. We have independent assortment. Um, and so it's just happening randomly. Sex cells are inherently different from sex chromosomes, which are chromosomes X and Y. Um, eggs generally just have an X chromosome. Sperm can have an X or a Y chromosome, uh, assuming that there's no chromosomal non-disjunction. So again, there's a difference between a cell and a chromosome. Sex cells are egg and sperm. Sex chromosomes are X and Y. Um, and X and Y chromosomes have genes that are associated with secondary sex characteristics, specifically the SRY gene on the Y chromosome. Um, and so we talked about sex different differentiation um, and sex determination in the last lecture. So when there's uh, genes on the X and Y chromosome, um, they are they may code for secondary sex characteristics in which you know they're considered inherently part of the sex chromosome, or they might be sex linked. So they're on the X chromosome or they're on the Y chromosome, but they don't have anything to do with sex determination. Um, so there's common examples like color blindness. So a lot of people are red green color blind, um, in which case they wouldn't be able to see the five in the center of this spotted image. So when we're thinking about patterns of inheritance that have to do with sex linkage, one of them is X-linked dominant, which means that it's located on the X chromosome, a sex chromosome, and it's coded for by the dominant allele. So it might be expressed when the genotype is X big A, X big A, or X big A, X little A, or X big A, Y. So now we're considering both the combination of X and Y chromosomes, as well as tracking the alleles on the chromosomes. And since the chromosomal sex factors into those phenotype ratios now and uh, genotype ratios, we have to take that into consideration as well. So that's why we draw it with the X chromosome or the Y chromosome as the larger letter and then for um, the dominant allele, we track it like this. And because it's not located on the Y, we don't put anything there. The recessive allele would look like this right next to it. So not any higher, that's just kind of how I drew it. <laughs> okay, so one example is with Drosophila or fruit flies. Um, this is just tracking the different eye colors. And in this case, red eyes are X-linked dominant. So they're coded for by the dominant allele on the X chromosome. Um, so this is an example with red eyes on Drosophila. A human example is vitamin D resistant rickets, which is also coded for by a dominant allele on the X chromosome. So when we're thinking about X linkage and sex linkage generally, the pedigrees that result or the pundit squares that result are really influenced by the chromosomal sex of the affected parents because one parent might have the X, second X chromosome, uh, the other parent might only have a Y, in which case they're not carrying that other allele. So if um, we're looking at X-linked dominant and we have an affected father, that means that there's no other um, X chromosome to kind of balance that out. And so it results in unaffected sons because all of the sons are going to get a Y chromosome from their father. There's no chance of them getting that X chromosome but all of the daughters would receive an X chromosome from their father. So they would all be affected. So when 
we were talking about X-linked dominant. If the father is affected, none of the sons will be affected. All of the daughters will be affected. If we're thinking about an X-linked dominant um, condition and looking at a heterozygous mother who is affected, then that would result in 50% affected sons and 50% affected daughters uh, because there's an equal likelihood of her passing on an X chromosome that has the allele versus not having the allele. If the affected mother were homozygous dominant, then everyone would be affected. So again, uh, with the affected father, no sons receive an X chromosome from the father, 0% are affected, and all of the daughters receive an X chromosome from the father, so 100% of their, them are affected. With a heterozygous affected mother, all the children receive an X chromosome from mother, and there's a 50% chance of her passing on a dominant allele. So oftentimes when we're talking about X-linked conditions, we focus really heavily on X-linked recessive because that's where some interesting patterns emerge. Um, it's when it's located on a sex chromosome, again, specifically the X chromosome, and it's, oh shoot, this should say recessive allele. I'm really sorry about that. So, uh, I'll have to fix that when I post the lecture again. Um, so the recessive allele is expressed only when the genotype, this is correct down here, I don't know what I was thinking, um, expressed only when the genotype is uh, two X chromosomes with two recessive alleles or a single X chromosome and Y chromosome, the single X chromosome has a recessive allele. So in these cases, there's not gonna be a second X chromosome to balance things out. So there's a higher incident rate in chromosomal males, so in sons. Um, and again, a really common example of this in humans is colorblindness, and that's why it, especially red-green colorblindness tends to be more common in males. And so we see that in um, this Punnett square on the top right, there's a father with normal vision, so a dominant allele on the X chromosome and then a Y chromosome, and a carrier mother who, again, is not colorblind, but is carrying the allele for colorblindness. So um, there's a 50% chance of the son having normal vision versus being colorblind. One daughter has normal vision and one daughter is a carrier. Um, and we see that affected, or we see that uh, carried out in the pedigree as well. Hemophilia is another X-linked recessive condition, which you might've heard about um, with the Russian royal family. Um, and so there was a long history of kind of uh, royals being interrelated. Um, and so some of these X-linked recessive conditions became more prominent. So again, we see it here with an unaffected father and a carrier mother and the incident rate being much more likely in males. So there's other unique patterns of inheritance like co-dominance and incomplete dominance. In co-dominance, two alleles are expressed equally. So they don't mix in any way. They are both fully expressed simultaneously. And a common example of this is blood type. In incomplete dominance, neither allele is dominant. So it's not that they're both dominant, it's that neither allele is dominant. And heterozygotes result in a new blended phenotype. So oftentimes hair texture and eye color are examples of this. So again, with uh, AB blood type, you get both A and B antigens. Um, with incomplete dominance with colors, you get a blending with heterozygotes. And this is just a little bit of extra information about how to solve pedigrees. Okay, so that was the first part of the lecture that you for sure need to watch and listen to before lab on Friday, um, but the rest of it you can kind of integrate over the course of the next few weeks. Okay, so getting into development, so the physiology of fertilization, pregnancy, labor, and early life. Um, so we'll start with fertilization, which occurs in the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes. Um, spermatozoa are mature and are going to penetrate an oocyte, and we'll talk about that process in just a moment. Remember, that's when uh, meiosis is fully complete and the egg 
finishes it up and becomes a fully matured ovum, and then it starts going through these cascade of events that happen during fertilization. So in order for the sperm to get to the egg, a lot of stuff has to physiologically happen. Um, I'll remember that a lot of sperm are killed right away due to the low pH environment of the vagina, and a lot of sperm are lost by going into the wrong uterine tube or fallopian tube. Um, but this process is made a little bit easier by a process called capacitation or priming. So the uterus does secrete fluids that one, serve to improve sperm motility, but also include sterile binding albumin. Um, that's really important because it helps to start break down the membrane of the head of the sperm so that it's going to allow that genetic release of material from that head um, so that it can cross into the egg. There's also lipoproteins and enzymes in these secretions. So uh, when the sperm kind of approaches the egg, you start having these acrosomal reactions. The acrosome is that fluid-filled cap of the sperm. Um, it starts releasing different digestive enzymes and clears a path through the zona pellucida, uh, which is that outer layer of the egg. Um, so because of the series of reactions, the sperm is able to reach the sperm banding receptors that are on the, the outside of the oocyte. Um, so I'm going to really emphasize that acrosomal reactions, plural, uh, because many sperm have to perform those reactions in order to clear a path for the sperm that eventually fertilizes the egg. Uh, so we talk a lot about the sperm that reaches the egg being the fastest or the sperm that fertilizes the egg being the fastest. It's not actually the first one that gets there. It's the first one that gets there after a path has been cleared. So once a sperm reaches an egg, it's really important to prevent polyspermy. Poly meaning many, spermy meaning sperm. Um, so having even one extra chromosome can be fatal. Remember that we talk about trisomy 21 or Down syndrome quite often because that's a rare example of polyspermy or of, uh, sorry, trisomy or extra chromosomes not being fatal, uh, but many trisomies result in fatality. So if you were to have a whole extra set of chromosomes, 23 extra chromosomes, that's not compatible with life. So these different cells have to have mechanisms to stop polyspermy from occurring. And one really fast way is the fast block. So right away, um, there's a change in the depolarization or the, the membrane potential of the oocyte. So uh, we get more sodium permeability. Remember that sodium entering the membrane uh, raises the or depolarizes um, the membrane. It raises the uh, po membrane potential, makes it more positive. And so as soon as that happens, you get this fast influx of sodium ions, um, and so that depolarizes the oocyte, and then more sperm cells are not able to fuse. So that happens very quickly. And then more slowly, you have this other series of reactions called the slow block. Um, and so we have this influx of calcium ions that causes these cortical granules to fuse with the plasma membrane. Um, those are called the cortical reactions. And then we get the formation of the fertilization envelope, which is made up of uh, structures of the egg, so that zona pellucida, um, as well as mucopolysaccharides. So we have a stronger fertilization envelope forming um, that prevents polyspermy. And actually, uh, when I taught at San Francisco State, we used to fertilize sea urchin eggs with sea urchin sperm. And you could watch this fertilization membrane or fertilization envelope uh, pop up under the microscope. It was really cool. So I'll try to remember to post a video of that that I have. OK, so uh, between the time of fertilization and becoming an embryo, we have certain developmental stages. Um, so this is called pre-embryonic development. And so some highlights are when fertilization happens, it becomes a zygote. We have a marula, which is when it uh, you've gone through different rounds of cell division and you end up with 16 cells. So two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16. And then you have the blastocyst. Um, the blastocyst has a portion called the trophoblast, um, and so that's when you have between 70 and 100 cells. So I'm going to emphasize that because I want to talk about the mechanism of in vitro fertilization. Um, in vitro means kind of in uh, 
plastic, so kind of uh, outside of the body. Um, and so that's not happening inside the body, but it's eventually going to get implanted. So this is a uh, reproductive technology that's really special for a lot of people. Um, and there's a very particular set of steps in order to accomplish in vitro fertilization to help with people's fertility. So we've talked a lot about different hormones, different gonadotropins. When we say exogenous, we mean that it's coming from outside of the body. So uh, the person who's making eggs will take different gonadotropins, um, and then eventually the eggs will be collected from the follicles directly, and the sperm will also be collected separately and concentrated. So one of the gonadotropins that they take is FSH, which stimulates follicles. It matures anywhere from 10 to 20 follicles instead of just a few at a time. Then LH is taken, which triggers um, some of those processes that lead up to ovulation. So kind of uh, breaking apart the follicle, getting the egg ready to be released. And then right as it's being released is when they're collected. So the eggs and sperm were then mixed or the sperm is directly injected into the egg if there's problems with sperm motility, um, which has its own fancy terminology. So intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI. Um, and then the embryos are incubated until the blastocyst stage. So when you allow it to go through several rounds of cell division, all the way up to between 70 and 100 cells, there's higher implantation success rate. The blastocyst is then injected directly into the uterus using a catheter. So regardless of whether you have fertilization occurring uh, in the uterine tubes or in vitro, you then have implantation and a, a whole series of physiological changes associated with that. So some of the signaling and physiological changes of implantation, um, the trophoblast secretes HCG. So HCG is coming from a few different places. Um, remember that generally when you reach this point, if pregnancy doesn't happen, the corpus luteum degrades into the corpus albicans and stops secreting different hormones. But if you have HCG being secreted, that directs the corpus luteum to survive and then produce estrogen and progesterone. Remember that progesterone is considered the pregnancy hormone, so having a consistent source of it is very important. HCG then accumulates in the maternal bloodstream, and by about uh, week nine, you have enough HCG being excreted in the urine in order for a pregnancy test to detect it. A pregnancy test has antibodies on it that connect with HCG, um, and that's how that process works. So this was a slide that you saw in week eight showing what a placenta looks like. Um, remember that it's an organ that belongs to the fetus. That's going to come back in just a moment when we talk about fetal circulation. Um, and that it is important because it releases hormones, including HCG. Um, and the placenta also secretes estrogens as well as progesterone. So Initially, the corpus luteum is a very important source of hormones during pregnancy. Eventually, the placenta takes over. So some other functions of the placenta, which is fully developed as an organ by about 16 weeks, um, it's involved in nutrition and digestion. So uh, certain types of material can diffuse and enter um, through the placenta to the uh, fetal circulatory system. It also stores nutrients early on in pregnancy to be used later. It's involved in excretion and filtration, as well as respiration. So uh, from going from the maternal circulatory system to the fetal circulatory system, it's taking oxygen in and then carbon dioxide out from the fetus to the maternal circulatory system. Like I mentioned, it secretes HCG, estrogen, and progesterone as part of endocrine function, and it also mediates the maternal hormones that might be going into the fetus and the fetal hormones that might be going out. So there are some things that can cross the placenta. Um, whole cells do not cross, which is very important because uh, oftentimes there's certain antigens and antibodies that you don't want to cross and cause immunological problems and reactions, but there are certain things that can cross the placenta. So obviously oxygen and carbon dioxide have to be able to cross so that CO2 doesn't build up in the fetus and oxygen is able to get in. That occurs just through passive diffusion. 
Lipid-soluble nutrients can also cross through passive diffusion, but water-soluble nutrients like glucose require facilitated diffusion, so specific channels and pumps, um, or mostly channels. Um, amino acids and iron require active transport, which would be more pumps that require ATP, but those are very important for fetal development. Um, another lipid-soluble component are fetal phytotoxins, so these are toxic substances to the fetus that can cross through passive diffusion. So they, if they're in uh, the maternal body, they can easily cross to the fetus. And these include things like alcohol, nicotine, certain drugs, and pathogens. So there's a lot of changes to amniotic fluid, um, which is the fluid that surrounds the fetus and protects it um, from temperature changes and pressure. Um, it starts out mostly as just maternal filtrate, so what you would expect to kind of find um, in the early stages of the nephron. Uh, but by about the eighth week of pregnancy, the kidneys of the fetus are sufficiently working to add urine to the amniotic fluid. Um, so the amniotic fluid to blood volume uh, ratio changes. So we talked about kind of the development of the fetus already, specifically in terms of sex determination. We talked about the SRY gene, which is an example of a Y-linked gene, uh, although it's not necessarily Y-linked, it's just on the Y chromosome. It's a really important part of what's on the chromosome. Um, this again leads to male development. So initially, that tissue that becomes gonads is by potential. It can develop either into ovaries or testes. If there's no SRY activation, if there's no SRY gene, um, then you get ovaries. If there is SRY activation, you get testes. So um, I mentioned late, uh, the late egg cells. We're going to talk about that in lab on Friday. Um, testosterone release from those cells is critical to this process of development and sex determination. So if there's no testosterone, um, there's certain external and internal changes. If there is testosterone, there's certain external and internal changes. Again, we talked about this in the last lecture, um, but I did want to kind of briefly touch on these Mullerian and Wolfian ducts and show you a visualization of that process. Early on in development, you have both Mullerian and Wolfian ducts that connect to a cloaca, which is a central cavity that later becomes um, the vagina, in some cases, uh, the urethra for sure, and the rectum. Um, and so if the Mullerian ducts degrade and the Wolfian ducts remain, then you get the testy, uh, then you get, um, not necessarily the testes, but you have the epididymis and the vas deferens. If the Wolfian ducts are the ones that degrade and the Mullerian ducts remain, those become the fallopian tubes and the uterus. So I just wanted to, to have a visualization of that process. In terms of the fetal circulatory system, I mentioned, mentioned that oxygen and CO2 cross the placenta uh, passively. Um, I also wanted to remind you that the placenta is a fetal organ. It's their organ. Um, and so it has its own vein and two arteries. And so because it's connecting a structure that belongs to the fetus and the fetal heart, blood flow through those veins and arteries is characterized in relationship to the fetal heart. So that umbilical, umbilical vein is bringing oxygenated blood from the maternal circulatory system, as well as nutrients to the fetus from the placenta because veins return blood to the heart. So it's bringing oxygenated blood to the heart and then the umbilical arteries take carbon dioxide and waste from uh, to the placenta from the fetus. So they're moving blood away from the heart through the placenta back to the maternal circulatory system. So in terms of the fetal digestive system, you might have heard of meconium. You might have seen a lot of meconium if you have kids. Um, but it, meconium is generally like a routine part of early life, but it can be very dangerous in certain situations. Um, it's basically fetal feces that accumulates during pregnancy. It's really uh, a unique texture. It's tarry and greenish. It has a lot of amniotic fluid, cell debris, mucus, and bile. And it starts accumulating in the intestines around weeks 13 to 16. Um, and it really just builds up in there. And so for 
the first several days after birth, um, the baby is passing meconium. But when you have fetal hypoxia, that can be really serious because it can cause the, um, the fetus to release meconium in utero, so into the amniotic fluid, but hypoxia also triggers a gasping reflex. So that can cause um, the, the fetus, the newborn, to um, aspirate meconium to breathe it in, which can lead to a lot of very serious epithelial damage and a lot of downstream physiological effects. So when you have large chunks, basically, of meconium um, being aspirated, that causes a full air, uh, upper airway obstruction. So that leads to acute hypoxia. When you have smaller particles, those can lead to chemical inflammation and infection and also mechanical obstruction, either incomplete or complete, but either way you get um, hypoxemia. So hypoxia uh, proceeds to hypoxemia. Um, you get hypercarbia, so a buildup of carbon dioxide, and you have respiratory acidosis. So um, you have a, a low pH condition associated with high carbon dioxide. So there's also an increased risk of infection. Um, even though meconium is generally sterile, it can lead to complications that lead to infection. It can also result in a low APGAR score. So when we're talking about APGAR score, that's a really important metric that you take um, following birth. Um, it's a non-invasive scoring technique to measure the health of a newborn, and it looks at um, infant activity, so their muscle tone, their pulse, their grimace, so how they respond to stimulation, um, their appearance, basically, are they blue or are they pink, um, and then respiration. And it's called APGAR uh, because it was invented by an anesthesiologist named Dr. Virginia APGAR in 1952. The most important parts of this um, are pulse and respiration, and the highest possible score is a 10. So remember, we looked at this infographic summary, summary of hormonal regulation of the ovarian cycle um, and the menstrual cycle. Um, so we looked at menstruation, the follicular phase, ovulation, the luteal phase, and pregnancy or return to menstruation. And in the reproductive lecture, we kind of stopped at returning to menstruation. Um, but here we're going to look at how hormones change during pregnancy. So uh, remember that at a certain point as the placenta develops, we transition from the corpus luteum producing estrogen and, and progesterone to the placenta taking over that endocrine role. Um, but late in pregnancy, progesterone starts to drop um, at a much faster rate than estrogen drops. So we're going to see kind of changing ratios of estrogen and progesterone. That allows for contractions. So remember, progesterone maintains a safe environment for the fetus to develop, but at a certain point, it needs to be born. So you have um, progesterone dropping, and so a lot of the inhibitory effects of it are going to go away. You also have oxytocin spiking at the very end of pregnancy, which is responsible for that positive feedback loop that allows for labor and delivery. And a hormone called thyrotropin increases thyroid hormones and metabolism, which is responsible for a lot of the hot flashes and extreme hunger that you get during pregnancy. Um, I also want to point out prolactin uh, is one that is produced by the pituitary gland that increases towards the end of pregnancy to kind of prepare the body for milk production, but it's generally inhibited by progesterone until the end of pregnancy. So some basic physiological changes that happen to organ systems during pregnancy. Um, in terms of your digestive and urinary systems, there's an increase in morning sickness uh, due to increased hormones and decreased peristalsis. Uh, one really awesome trick, if you have any pregnancies coming up, is to take a medication called the Unisom at night. It's an antihistamine and sleeping aid, kind of similar to Benadryl, but there's a very particular Unisom that um, you take at night, and then you take vitamin B complex in the morning. Uh, vitamin B complex, or so different vitamin Bs, are part of just normal prenatal vitamins, so you're taking them already. Um, that combination is uh, marketed to pregnant people, and uh, it's super expensive, but you can just get Unisom at the store. Um, so 
You can completely avoid morning sickness if you take that combination. It's very, very helpful. Um, you also get gastric reflux, constipation, increased urination, and increased urine production. In terms of your circulatory system, there's an increase of blood volume, anywhere from one to two extra liters of blood, um, as well as an increased pulse and pressure and decreased venous return, uh, which leads to a lot of kind of swelling as well as um, those varicose veins. There's also a lot of respiratory issues. So you have to really increase your volume of gas inhaled per minute um, by at least 50%. But the problem is that pressure from the developing fetus leads to decreased tidal volume, which can lead to shortness of breath. You also have increased blood flow, which leads to congestion. Um, in terms of the integumentary or skin system, uh, your dermis stretches, that causes striae or stretch marks. Um, and you also have an increase in melanocyte stimulating hormone, which leads to the linea nigra, which is that line that extends from the belly button to the pubis, as well as darkened areola, which are important for lactation. Um, it can also cause an increase in melanin production all across your face, which is called the mask of pregnancy, but that doesn't happen to everyone. Some other changes that happen uh, specifically during childbirth include an increased estrogen to progesterone ratio. Remember that progesterone drops and estrogen remains pretty high. Um, and so that changing ratio and lack of inhibition from progesterone is associated with those early Braxton Hicks contractions as well as true contractions. There's also the lo loosening and expulsion of the mucus plug, which is also called bloody show. Um, and then you have that big spike of oxytocin um, from the posterior pituitary and also more oxytocin receptors in the myometrium. So those muscle, that muscle layer of your uterus has more receptors for oxytocin. It's able to detect that signal more strongly and have a stronger response. Um, the fetal membrane secretes prostaglandins, and because you have the fetus pressing against the cervix, um, causing that increase in oxytocin secretion, causing contractions, causing more pressing on the cervix, um, you get that positive feedback loop and true labor develops. But if your uh, baby is off center and not pressing against the cervix, you don't get um, a true feedback loop and you end up in labor for 48 hours before you end up having to get a C-section. So when you're thinking about how an infant might adjust and maintain homeostasis after they're born, um, there's a few different ways that they do that. One is they have to breathe on their own. Um, so when they have those CO2 levels building up, they get respiratory acidosis. Um, remember that low pH conditions can be caused by high CO2, which is respiratory acidosis, or low bicarbonate, which is metabolic acidosis. Um, here, this is respiratory acidosis that activates the respiratory center in the brain and the infant takes a breath. In terms of thermoregulation, um, they go through non-shivering thermogenesis. So we often shiver in order to generate heat, but they can break down brown fat that's distributed across their back, chest, and shoulders. Um, brown fat is extra vascularized and uh, cells um, have, or like the storage cells have a lot of really unique mitochondria um, and can undergo different reactions that are kind of normally considered wasteful because they're high heat, low ATP, but that's perfect for thermoregulation. Also in terms of GI and urinary changes, there's the establishment of the gut microbial community uh, just from being out in the world, but also through breast milk. Um, and again, not everyone can feed that way, which is absolutely understandable. So it's just one way that their gut microbial community can develop. Um, there's also, oh, maybe I should add, um, I might have already mentioned this, but if you have a C-section and you are worried about your infant's um, microbial community and microbiome, uh, some hospitals allow you to do a vaginal swab. So you can swab um, that area and then wipe it on the infant's face so that they get the same microbes that they would get through vaginal birth. Um, just a fun fact. 
so uh, also neonatal kidneys have really a lot of trouble concentrating urine through the loop of Henle. Um, so they end up producing lots of dilute urine, which is why it's really important for them to get a lot of milk or formula um, so that they don't have that risk of dehydration. Okay, so then after childbirth, when babies are being fed, if they're being fed through breast milk, um, one reflex that's happening here is the letdown reflex. It's a positive feedback loop. So basically what happens is the infant suckles, that triggers sensory nerve impulses, which cue oxytocin release, as well as milk producing cells or lactocytes. Um, so then the combination of that uh, triggers this squeezing response so that the milk travels into these lactiferous sinuses before it's discharged. Um, the more milk that's produced, the more suckling happens, and so it's a positive feedback loop. In terms of the content of breast milk, uh, throwing it way back to week three when we looked at that lactose case study. Um, initially, early breast milk over the first couple of days is considered colostrum. It's a lot thicker, um, it's kind of a yellowy color, um, and it's much more rich in immunoglobulins, protein, and sodium. Uh, mature breast milk is surprisingly low in protein, uh, but it has a lot of fat and a lot of sugar, specifically lactose. Okay, so that is the whole lecture. I know it's very long and I encourage you to split it up into many parts. Um, you guys have worked really hard this semester. I know it's a lot of material to get through, especially when you're doing it at your own pace. Um, so let's get through these last few weeks. You got this.